Um, okay. And so this week, and we're going to start on the tabular data, which essentially is just table data. And you probably should be familiar by now. Table is one of the data sets. So this week, we're going to discuss different techniques which people can be can be used to visualize table data and when to use which one. And just first quick, very quickly, and this is what we have been covered, covering so far. And we talked about last week, and this is more like two weeks now, two weeks ago now, we talked about uh, markers and channels. Marks represents the item. So each mark is an item and depends on the dimensionality of the marks. You can have 0D mark, which are point, which means it don't really have, say, lens or area. It only has a position and color. And then you have 1D mark, and which are the lines. So besides the position, the line can also have one dimension, and which is a lens that can be changed. And then you have 2D marks, which is areas. And because it's 2D, besides area, you can actually have different shapes as well. So these are the more complex ones. The more common 2D marks may be just a circle or a square. And uh, <clears throat> finally, you can have 3D marks. So these are 3D shapes that you can use and to represent the items in your data set. Uh, we already mentioned this a few times. Say the 3D mark, uh, there's some issues with 3D validation. So uh, it's not very common to have 3D marks. Hmm? Okay, and also we talked about marks and channels and the channels change the appearance or control the appearance of the mark. And uh, it's used to represent the attributes. And so for example, the mark may be each items or each product you have for the superstore or supermarket. And then the attributes would be say its name and its price, prof profitability, its category, etc. Okay, and there's many different possible mark channels, sorry, channels, and position, and you can have X and Y, or horizontal and vertical positions. It can be used to represent numerical values you have for the uh, items or the data. And you can also have color. So color is better used to represent categorical attributes of the product or the data, rather than say, and you could use that to represent numerical values, but usually it doesn't work that well. And then similar for shape, shape is usually good for categorical values, not less, much less so for numbers. And you can have tilt, and finally size. Size is probably uh, the most common one. And for 2D, it's lens. And sorry, for 1D, it's lens. For 2D, and the size is area, and for 3D, it's volume. Okay, and then we did some uh, discussion in terms of the effectiveness of different channels, because once you had decided on which channel to represent, for example, the profit, profit of a product, and you know, and there's many options to show that profit as a number, and then these are the list of different channels you can use ranked from the most effective ones to the least effective ones. So we talk about how did we measure this? For example, how accurate, one of the factors is how accurate these channels can represent and values visually. For example, if you increase the value by all the channel representation, and by 100% that people in perceive a 100% increase in the value. So as a result, the position is the most effective ones or the aligned positions is the most effective ones in terms of representing numerical values. And then it goes down and becomes lens and angle and say the curves and the 3D shapes or the 3D volume rather, and is the least effective ones. And on the right hand side, we have a similar list, but this is more for categorical attributes. So this part is all for numerical attributes. 
and this part is for categorical attributes. And again, ordered from the most effective ones to the least effective ones. Okay. And um, you don't really have to memorize this, but say when you do do your design, do you want to come back here and check which one is the most effective channel and try to use the most effective ones as you can. So the general rules, you should always use the most effective ones. So first you decide whether it's a, a numerical attributes or categorical attributes. And once you decide it's a numerical attributes, you pick the most effective one. And the only not using the only reason to not use the most effective ones is if it's already been used for something else you can't use it anymore and for example if you had first numerical attributes you represented use position and the second one also use position so one x one i and the third one you can't use position anymore then you probably think about using size and particularly one d size to represent it Okay, and then mm -hmm. ah, okay, I see. And so also, and um, after we talked about channels and the marks, we talked about some general guidelines that is quite common or useful when you try to design validation. And the first one is about three D, and the general rule is say usually you want to avoid using 3D unless there's very good reason to do it. And one of the good reasons we gave as an example is the data itself is 3D. And otherwise you can have these potential issues. And so for example, and the, you might not be able to perceive the depths very accurately. And you might have occlusions, so things behind might be blocked by things in the front, and you may have distortions which lose information because it's 3D, things no longer parallel, and things further away would look smaller. So these things made it difficult to use 3D, or harder to see and to judge the values when it's reprinted in 3D. And the second one is eyes piece memory. If you want to show in some temporal series, the data that changes over time, and you might want to consider carefully if you want to use an animation, which we see in animation, which shows the flights between the states and the Europe. And the problem is it's difficult to remember what happened before using visualization. The user probably have to go through the visualization back and forth to find out what happened. And we also talk about the resolution over immersion. And the idea being, so now that uh, you have three, you have say VR or AR glasses, and they give you the immersion in the sense, you feel most, feels more realistic. And, but the cost is you have to use, you can only use half the display because the other half have to be used just to represent the same information and with very slightly difference, one for each eye. Essentially, you sacrifice half the display to produce this immersion feeling, and then you want to make sure that's actually worth it. And next, we talked about an, a general guideline or rules of how to and how to visualize and very, very large data sets in the sense you don't have, and you don't have enough display space to show everything. For example, you have millions of items in your data collection. So what you do, and you do an overview, and which is a aggregated or simplified view of all the data, and then you do zoom and filter in the sense it allows the user to zoom in to see part of the data in more details or filter out certain things. So this is like the example, like the old version of Google map, it provided an overview of the entire map and you allow user to zoom in and filter, what, zoom into certain part of the map and filtering out the things they don't want. And finally, for the old 
the lowest level of details, you allow the details on demand in a sense. You click on, the, say, a place and what display all more details at that particular place. So you can imagine it's not possible to show the details about all the places at the same time. Okay, um, so this is again, uh, this is further back now and the week when we talked about uh, date and date types, we're gonna go through this one now. And uh, we have these common data types, which are tables, network trees, fields, geometry, and classes. And for this week, we're gonna just focus on the validation design for the first type of first data set type, which is a table, which contains items and attributes. And the tables doesn't have to be 2D. And so this is what we saw before, uh, or most common one is a 2D table, but potentially you can have a 3D tables, for example. And this is a table where you have two keys to represent one attribute. Oh, sorry, you can have two keys to identify each items in the data. And in terms of attributes, there's no limit. You can still have many, many different attributes. And so examples of these multiple keys is, for example, if we need to identify a person, let's say identify a person in a university or student in a university. And you could just use one key, for example, student number. Then each student would have a unique number and you can easily identify them. But for example, if you only use name and it might not be enough to identify a person. So that means just one key might not be enough and you might have to introduce another key, for example, date of birth or address as a second key. And you, in that case, you might even need three keys, all three attributes, say name, uh, the date of birth and say address to uh, three keys to identify a person. Obviously we couldn't quite draw a table with three keys because the maximum we can do will be 3D as we can draw. Okay, um, as we already mentioned a little bit, and so the key is the independent attributes and used as the index to look up or identify an item. So that's the key. And uh, the simple table, and we already said, can have only one key, and the key can either be, so the key will essentially just be one of the attributes. So this is your normal and table, and each row represents the items, and there are many, many attributes. So one of these attributes if it can be used to uniquely identify an item, then that becomes the key. So, and if you learned any, if you have done anything about SQL and database before, and the concept of key is very similar as the database for each table in the, say in the, in the database, you need to have a key to uniquely identify each row or so each items in that table. So it's exactly the same concept here. So as we mentioned before, and you can have multiple uh, multi-dimensional tables in the sense you have multiple keys. So the multi-dimensional here is not means by attributes. You can always have multiple attributes. Each one after it has one dimension. Here, all we all, the multi-dimension is referred to the keys itself. And so you can have a two key and the key itself and forms a matrix. So we saw this picture early on already, and you can potentially have a table. You need two attributes to identify and unique items, and the rest can be used just as attributes. Okay, so, and, okay, the other thing maybe to remember is, say the multiple table does not have to be look like a straight like this, like a cube, it could just be, and the most likely would just look like this as well. You have each rows as a data and each 
column as attributes, it just says there's no single attribute will be enough to identify an item. So you need two columns as keys to identify an item in the rows. So actually most likely, and it was to look like this, but it just says there's no single column can be used as the key. You need two or more. Okay, and uh, so, and the value are in a sense dependent attributes and it's dependent on the key, which when the key changes, it changes different items and the, the value changes. And essentially, and every other attribute that's not key and becomes a called value. Okay, and so it's usually classified based on the number of keys and uh, you can have, you should have at least one and then maybe two and three and more. Okay, and next we're gonna and talk about and different validations that can be used to rep represent uh, table data. And uh, some of these are quite common, you're probably already familiar with, but we're gonna look at this from the way we talked about in terms of markers, channels, and in terms of talks about and keys and values. But also we're gonna talk about which type of chart is good for which type of analysis tasks. <clears throat> And so we're going to start with a scatter plot. I'm sure, and most of you would know what scatter plot is. You have two dimensions, the x and y, and you put data as points on the chart, each point for one data, and use the x and y to represent two values of the data. Okay, and so first, and what is the mark and in scatter plot? Anyone knows? Points. Points, yeah. Anyone else? Position x, no. y, x. And sorry, it was uh, very quiet. I couldn't quite hear. Um, he was saying position x and y axis. Oh, okay. So, Someone also says position, which is X and Y axis. And that's very relevant, but that is not mark. And position is one of the channels. So it's definitely correct when we talk about the channels. Okay. And so inter terms mark and it's point. So that's how you represent each row or each item in your data as each your point. And, but in this particular example, uh, it is actually a shape or a circle is a mark because these actually have different sizes. And so once you have the size for each mark, and this can't, cannot be a point anymore, it has to be a 2D shape. In this case, it's and the mark is circle. And this type of chart, just to differentiate from standard scatter plot where and data has to be points, and this is called bubble chart because each circle is like a bubble. Okay, and now we're going to talk about the channels. Channels, as we mentioned before, uh, is the thing that you, the visual encoding to use to represent the attributes. And I think someone already said, so in the scat plot, you use the X and Y positions to represent two values or two attributes of your each data item. So that can represent two. So for example, and use the position to represent attributes. And in this particular one, uh, one of them is the life expectancy. It's very small, you probably couldn't see. And the other one, it says infant mortality. Okay. And is there any other channels we used here? Besides color the position? Size. Sorry? Size, color and size. Yes. yes, very good. So this one, 
actually they use two more and the first one is color so you can see each of these dots has colors and this color and is used to represent and categorical values and finally the size so each of these circles has its own size as well so just to give you an example so this is and from a tool called and gap minder so this is like the online version of it and more modern version of what's shown there and so what it does is just exactly what we see before and each, each circle is a country and so that's indian that's china and that's china and it shows at a particular year where the values of these countries are and so for example this is the year 1800 and there's two um, axes which are the two channels to represent two attributes so i'm not sure if you can see the word uh, let me see if we can make it a bit okay it does work so hopefully the text is bigger enough to see now and so this side and shows that life expectancy of these countries so on, on average how long people can live and on this side is the average income of the people in that country again each circle is country and you can easily change uh, these two dimensions to map different so for example in the access and uh, we can choose say child mortality okay and it give you quite the different uh, look uh, also let me see where do you do the size ah, okay and if you change this one and you can set the color so currently the color you can see is sent, set to the continent so the asian is red and europe is yellow and africa is blue and american okay american for north and south it is all green and uh, there should be a setting that allows you to change the size as well somewhere uh, zoom options okay so you can say size currently okay size is currently mapped to population again you can map the size to different attributes that you have and so numbers of children per woman how much CO2, mortality, life expectancy. So you could, oh, there's more as well. You could and add to that. Okay, so usually what it does, and it shows how these things changes over time from 1800 to today. So you can click this button and it will start. And you can see these things start to moving around and life expectancy jumping up and down. That's what is happening. But in general, you can see and all the countries here, starting from the, this end with lower life, life expectancy and lower income move towards up there. And obviously, and this is now 1952, you can see mostly here are the and yellow ones, which are the countries in Europe, because they are doing better. Compared to here, you have more countries which are in red, which are those in and Asia. And obviously, the two big ones are the China and India. Okay, and so you can see now the entire world is moved to this corner, and everyone has more income and also longer life expectancy. And also the difference between the continents are less obvious. Now kind of all, all these Asian countries is moved to the middle and then the bottom ones are the all African countries now mostly lagging a little bit behind. Okay, so that's like a, one of the common examples used for bubble chart or scatter plot. Professor, I have a question before you proceed. Yeah. 
Um, uh, what, what's the reason? Uh, because you said in the previous slide, you said that uh, uh, just before that one, you said before that this the one. shape. Okay, uh, no, it's this one actually. Sorry. This one. You said that the shape. Yeah, you said that the shape is the mark. But from my understanding, and from the notes, uh, the shape is mostly a channel that is used. Is the reason why it's, it's, it is a mark in this uh, particular uh, graph graphic. Yes, yes, and I think that's very good and point. And essentially, uh, I guess maybe the shape. Let me just check exactly what words I used before. Uh, so this is so this is when we talked about. Okay, and so actually the the correct word. It, should be called area exactly and should not be called shape and it should be called area so this is when we talk about 2d marks and then the shape itself should be a channel yeah which is exactly right so maybe let me just change that now and so the point should be an area yeah yeah, okay, I think it's clear now. Okay. Very good. Okay, and uh, so the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is about the uh, untransmog formation. So, and you could and display the attributes as they are, as this. So this is life expectancy, and this is the infant mortality. And but sometimes you might want to do some transformation, which will be help you make it easier to show the patterns in the data. And so, and this is plotted and the diamond price against carrots, which is, is the weight, the way the unit to measure the weight of the diamond. And so obviously the heavier the diamond, the more expensive they are. And the same, for example, here, it shows the weight of the diamond in carrots. So a lot of them actually under one carrot. There's quite a few and above, between one and two, and very few, which is above two. And then here um, is the price of these carrot, uh, of these diamond. And I don't know exactly what is that means, maybe $5,000, something like that, or some other units. Um, yeah, I guess it sounds about right. Say you can have a one carat diamond, which is one carat, where it costs about five thousand dollars. Okay, and then the question is, uh, obviously, you can see as the weights increase and the price increases as well, but the, the question is, how fast does this increase? So, does anyone want to have a guess? Is this a linear, which means it's almost increased like a straight line, or it's quadratic, means it's a square, and cubic, means it's a to the power of three, or exponential, in the most exponential means, so, and how do I say, it's say two or 10 to the power of the value. And anyone want to have a guess which one that is? Oh. So I believe it's quadratic. Quadratic, yeah. Okay, let me just do a quick poll if I can do this very quickly. Linear. Quadratic. And exponential. Okay, and so I just created a poll, and uh, I just want to people let's see 
I'll give you a few seconds just to to vote. Um, you probably should see an option. I don't know what this looks like on your screen. Somewhere my prompt you to say now there's a poll you can vote in. Okay, I'll give you maybe five more seconds if you could vote, then I'll show you the results. Okay. Okay, and so I think by now about three quarters of you have already voted. So I think we'll stop there. Okay, and then you can see this is the result. So you should be able to see the results on your screen now. So more than half the people think it's about quadratic, and there's a few, there's a few for linear and a few for cubic. But say the second most popular option and is exponential, and about a third people pick ex exponent exponential. So that's the thing. So this is kind of we all know it's increasing, but something quite difficult to tell just from visualization itself. And we can say it looks grows quite fast, so it's probably more than linear. But is it quadratic, cubic, or exponential? That's a little bit harder to see. So what we can do instead um, is we can change the way we plot the data along the axis. So instead of this one, which is linear, which is one, two, three, four, we can change it to this way, okay? So in this one, we plot in the log scale the attributes. And so instead of, let's say one, two, three, and four, this will be one, and then two, and then four, and then eight. Or maybe this will be 10, and then this will be 100, this will be 1,000, and this will be 10,000, okay? And similarly on this side, obviously the value is not that big, so we can't do say one, two, four, eight, or one, 10, 100, and 1,000. So instead this is 10 to the power of minus 0 0.6. And this is 10 to the power of minus 0 0.4, and so on and so forth. But, and it is constant, so next value, is always certain times bigger than the world value before. So this is 10 to the power of 0 0.2. That's always the difference between these two. And here is always the difference is the next value is 10 to the power of 0 0.5 bigger, times bigger than one before. And then you can see, and now the points looks like this. It almost can fit a straight line perfectly through these. So what it means, so that means this is actually an exponential growth. So if you plot both the axis in log scale, and th then the data becomes almost a straight line, that means this is log scale or exponential growth. So that means um, the price actually grows exponentially and with the weight. Okay, and so this is when you do some transformation, how you decide and how you display the data, and you might see the patterns more clearly in visual. Okay, and now we're going to introduce some of the and um, general guidelines. And so first, and um, what we want to say here is, um, as a scat plot, and it does not have any keys. It does not show the attributes that you can ident uniquely identify and each data point, and it's not shown, and it only shows the values, and it shows two quantitative values which are represented as and the x and y axis, and you could potentially do a say 3D scat plot, which allows you to say show three attributes, but as we already talked about before, 3D visualization has its issues, so you have to be really careful when you want to use 3D visualization or 3D scatter plot. 
And so the marker is point. And if we talk about the bubble chart, that becomes the area, which is a circle. And in terms of channels, are the two positions and horizontal and vertical. Okay. And so in terms of what scatter plot is good at, and it's good at showing the trend, for example, this one, you can see both the blue and orange one kind of goes from the lower left to move to the upper right. And then the blue one is usually and has higher values horizontally compared to the orange ones, etc. So that's the trend you can see. And it's easier to find outliers. So that's your outlier. Quite, you can spot it probably quite easily, this orange one here. And also you can find a distribution, which is quite similar to trend. But this is more specific, like we talked about previously, was that the linear expansion or ex exponential. That's the distribution and correlation. So correlation is when you talk about an, two attributes. And if you see there's any relationship between those, and so if we say that the blue and the red one are not part of the same data set, but just two attributes of the same data, then we might say they are positive correlated because they seem to be changing the same way. And finally, you can use that to do and clusters in the sense you might see, okay, there might be a groups of points and they are together, but those further away from the rest of the points. So I don't see that any obvious cluster here, except maybe this will be one big cluster with only this one outlier as an exception. Okay, and then as the and scalability, and that basically just means, and how many points you can potentially put in the validation. And so, and in the general, you can have hundreds of points. And I think here we probably has and already close to a hundred or maybe even more. I'm not sure how well it shows up on your screen. And the problems you have with more than a few hundred points is, and you started to have this overplotting problem they called, is that the points could be plotted on top of each other and you would not be able to quite tell how many points are there. Uh, professor, in this example, uh, what about the colors and uh, what about the shape? Okay. And so, so you could potentially use color or shape to represent additional attributes, and but are those not a part of the scatter plot design? If you know, and and scatter plot the main idea is to use the x, y, and y axis to represent two attributes. And that's the main, how do I say, the, the thing that makes it a scatter plot. So whether you want to use color or not, or whether you want to use shape or not, and sometimes you might add some labels to the each data point, which allows you to show and different, some info, additional attributes about the items. That's all okay. That's all and like variations of scatter plot, but itself is not part of the definition of cell. So whether using color or not does not necessarily make it a scatter plot or not, if that makes sense. It's just an option you can add on to later if you want. Okay. And then, so we had a one not look of the scatter plot, which is a very common one. And this is the second one. Again, it's, you've probably all seen that before, and which is the bar chart. Okay, and so a little bit different compared to the scatter plot is we mentioned the scatter plot does not show the key attribute, which is like the index, something that can an attribute that can be used to uniquely identify each data items, whereas the bar chart does. So in this case, it's showing the average weight of different type of animals. So on this x axis and it need to show different species of animals, which is the key. So that's the one you use to identify different animals and cat, wombat, and uh, this is a very odd one, capybara. 
Okay. So basically, and it's used one of the axis, which is the horizontal or X axis to show the key. And then it's used the other Y position or other channel to show one values. In this case is the average weight. And uh, yeah, and the, here the mark we call is the line. And so some people would say that mark will be the shape because this looks like a rectangle, but we say it's a line because we're only using the lens. We're not using the width of the mark to represent anything. And if we use both the lens and the width, then it becomes a shape. Sorry, it becomes an area. Sorry, should should call it area. Or you can say it's a rectangle. Okay. And in terms of the channel it used and it's aligned vertical positions. So all these and data, they start at the same point, they follow the same scale. So that's one of the most effective ones to show vertical, sorry, to show numerical attributes. Okay. And you could potentially order the other axis as well. But by definition, usually this will be a categorical value, for example. And it can potentially be a categorical value in this case, and the animal names. And you could impose some orders, but that's not the natural order. For example, you could change the order by, say, going to weight by the value of their weight. So they were going to sort it by the order by the weight of different animals, and you can change the orders as well. Professor, uh, if, we are, if we are able to order them right, then it comes to like the category. Okay, and then some simple, like a discussion, uh, some discussions about the bar chart. And so we're showing one categorical attributes, okay. and that's the categorical attributes, in this case, on the x, x axis. And it doesn't have to be on the axis, x axis, and you can have one on the y axis as well. So you just say the bar goes horizontally instead of vertically. That's completely fine. And then it shows one quantitative attribute, which is a value. So one key and one value, that's what this means. And also that's why previously in the, well, the scat plot, we say it's no keys and two values. Okay. And the marker is aligned and these are the channels and because it's using the lens of the mark which is line and so it's good at for quantitative values obviously not very good for the lens is not a good way to show and categorical values okay and the, on the other axis you use the position to show the value so this can be um, categorical values and I'm not sure if we can read here. And on this side, it shows different programming languages. And on this side, it shows how the usage of different programming languages by some measurements. I'm not sure this is an accurate or it's just as an example. Uh, professor, what about histogram? Whenever we are his using histogram, right? We are using both x-axis and y-axis, right? And uh, in x-axis, we mostly use, uh, uh, what do you say, a quantifiable value, right? In a histogram. So what will be the markers and channels for that? Will the markers be shape here or area here when it's a histogram? Yeah, okay. And that's a very good question. And so first, and is any, Everyone familiar with histogram? So yes. it's actually a very good, good point. So histogram itself and is not necessarily a uh, bar chart. It's, it looks quite similar, and but it's actually not a bar chart. Uh, let me see if I can find a picture.
Okay, so yeah, so I guess any of these will do. Uh, let me see if this is going to be any bigger. No, it's quite small. Let me find something a little bit. Uh, download save. Oh, maybe not the idea. Okay, maybe this will be better. Okay, so this is what a histogram look like. Let me make it a bigger. Okay. And so what it does, and it also shows lots of bars, which make it visually very similar to a bar chart. See, Y axis is the same as a bar chart. It shows one value, but the difference is the other axis, it also shows a value. So this here, it shows the price, dif price distribution of Airbnb apartments. So, and I guess uh, it, what you can say here is most of the apartments has a price between 50 and 100. And there's more and between 100 and 150 as well, but much less in terms of once this go beyond 150, how much less number. Okay. Um, so what you can see here, the X axis represents the price of the apartment and it's not a key. It's not really representing an item or let's say other way so what you representing here on the y axis again okay is also a bit different in the sense it's not representing a values or attributes of the item and it's actually some derived measurements which we're going to talk about later uh, i think we did so it's a count of the items in that bracket so and it looks similar and but the in the bar chart, the x axis shows individual items or shows the keys you can use to differentiate each individual items. Whereas here it's not, it's actually using values, and each bar is actually not representing one item. And for the y axis, it's similar, but it's showing different um, values or different type of values. It doesn't show any straight and strict uh, values directly from the village itself, but some derived values like accounting, the number of attributes. Okay. And so in terms of the markers and channels, it's still the same. And it's still using the line as a mark, and you use X and Y as the channels, but what they represent is different as a result, and it shows a, a different it becomes a, a different type of chart. So, so here still that... the channel will be, uh, uh, sorry, the marker will be still be a line, not shape here. That's right. So the marker is still a line, not shape in the sense, we only use the one dimension, which is the height to represent a value. And the width is here. The other dimension, the second dimension, doesn't represent any value. And, and, and why can't the mark be, a, be an area? Because it's like uh, you are going up a certain value on the x-axis and then another value in the y-axis. So meaning in that area, it shows the distribution, that particular area. Would, 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 would it be right to say that each bar represents a particular area? And would to, so you, Sorry, I didn't. No, I'm, I'm saying. I'm saying yeah. So yeah, I'm saying yeah. Uh, instead of uh, saying a line with the mark in, in like in a histogram, would it be right to say that it's the uh, area that's the mark? Because uh, as you can see, um, each bar I think represents a bin, and uh, isn't the bin like an area? 
that shows the, the, the number of items in that particular area. Yes, and each bar represents a bin, and but uh, the width of the bar does not represent any attributes. Uh, oh, okay. And so whether the bar is wider or narrower uh, makes no difference in terms of what the value it wants to represent. It always represents it's just one bin. Uh, okay. so yeah. Professor, but if we, if, we, if we take a bar as a bin, uh, then the vertical axis, uh, the width will be representing the number of elements in the bin, right? Sorry, the width will be representing, I missed the last bit. Uh, the width will be representing the number of elements in that particular bin. If we take a, a bar graph with bin. And the number of elements in the bin is represented by the height and not the width. So when I talk about width, I talk about from left to right. And uh, when I talk about height, it's this one. I say that's the height. So the number of items is represented by the height, not the width. And so I was just saying the height actually used to represent, that's one of the dimensions it used to represent something. But the width itself from left to right doesn't represent any attributes. That's why we say this is a line mark, not a area mark. Uh, so professor, is it right to say that uh, since it has a uniform distribution from in the x-axis, uh, uh, it, it, it does not having a varying width, right? So it, it is showing as a line as this, and uh, that's why it's not sh showing up as shape as a marker. Can you say it again? And so, okay, so, it, yeah. uh, so in a histogram, it's a uniform distribution between each bars, right? So that's why we are only considering length, uh, the line as a marker, not the shape. Uh, I'm not sure the the argument. You say it's a uniform distribution in the sense the, the x axis. Of, uh, no, yeah, yeah. The you uh, uh, so the interval between each bar length. Yeah. It will be uniform throughout all the bars, right? And could be, but when, and you so can we, potentially change the width of each bar. Say some bar will be become a bit wider than the other bar, and it's um, not very common. No. But potentially, you can do that. So if you do that, will in that uh, will the shape? Uh, if you do that, like the shape will be an attribute, right? It will add up as a shape as markers, right? Yeah, potentially. And if say if you change the width of each bar to represent some attributes, for example, if the value is, and if the count is higher, then you make it the bar wider as well, then that becomes an area mark or 2D mark. And so maybe I say, I would just say in this case, it's just because the width does not represent anything and it could change randomly. For example, just some bars randomly is wider than the others, and it's still a 1D mark, and it's still the argument because and the width is not representing anything, even though it's quite weird if you just have random width of different, different bars, which is probably going to make it harder to see. Thank you, Professor. No. Okay, let's get back to the actual slides. Um, okay. Good, good. I think these and um, discussion is very important. I think it's and bar chart itself is quite easy. Everybody knows how to use them, but say the the markers and channels are the part which are quite new, and uh, it's very useful to understand them a little bit better through a discussion like this. Okay, I think we covered, and you can do different. Okay, and so this is something a little bit different. Uh, you probably seen that already, but you're just not aware of that yet, or not aware of the name. And so this one is called a uh, stack the bar chart, and looks like this. In the sense, you still it's still a bar chart, a variational bar chart, and but each bar is separated into different segments. Um, 
and then the bar showing the overall value by adding these different segments together. Okay. And uh, so this is a part that can be a slightly confusing. And as a scat or stack the bar chart, and what does is does one quantitative value and the two categorical key attributes. Does that make sense to everyone? Oh, and can anyone tell me what is the quantitative value, quantitative attribute shown here? And what are the two and categorical key, categorical key attributes being shown here? Because uh, for the quantitative one, it could be on the y-axis, um, but the, what is it? It's not clear. Mass, masses. Yeah. Sorry. I said, I can, I can hear say the quantitative value is the y-axis, and yes. the categorical key is what? So it could the values represent represented by the colors. On, on the x-axis and the ones that are represented in different colors. Yes, okay. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Um, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're very close. And so in terms of the two categorical keys, so basically we, we talked about, say so the key is the attribute that you use to un uniquely identify each value. So if we say the values we are, I want to identify something like either this is how much this orange is or how much this red is. So you first have to decide which column that is. So that using the X axis, you can pick which bar. That's the first categorical attribute. And the second one is you need to decide which section of the bar that would be. So the bottom section or maybe the green section and then the dark red section or is that orange section. That will be the second categorical key attributes. So you use the vertical position and the section of the bar to identify a particular value. The amount of the value is shown as y-axis, you have to say. Okay, if you look at this, this um, orange one, the value is maybe about 2000. And it's a little bit hard to see, but this is, the case where actually not so easy to show the, see the values because it not always start from zero. Then you have to kind of mentally, mentally calculate, okay, where does this red start? Maybe say 9,000 here and finishes here is 28,000. So this one is about 19,000, which is, oh, sorry, about, yeah, 19,000, which makes it much harder to see the actual value. Okay, and so that's the mark. And also, and we have a special name for this type of mark. So this mark is a bit different. So it is a 2D shape, but it's also further divided into more complex structures, not then to say a rectangle, or just a line. So we call it uh, glyphs. So glyphs is just a common a, a kind of a term for any complex and marks. It's all called glyph. And obviously you can't have 1D glyph because it's only a point. You can't really make it more complex. And, but for 2D, you can have, sorry, for 1D, you can have different multiple line segments that becomes glyph. And then for 2D, which is area, and then you can have even more complex glyphs. And uh, yeah, and we have to use both and lens and the color. So lens is used to show or the y-axis is to show the uh, numerical or quantitative attributes and the x-axis and the color are used to show the two categorical keys. Okay, let me see how we are going. Oh, we're going a little bit behind. Okay, and so in terms of the task to do, so obviously if you're, just want to see the values of each individual uh, part, for example, the orange part or red part, and this might not be the best chart to do. Instead, it's good at showing the part to whole relationship in terms of, okay, 
overall how much is the value for each of these and how much of each part contributes to the overall value and that will be one of the tasks most suitable for the stack bar chart and also and it's good and to show the compared overall values right so it's good to compare for each of these stacked bars which one is higher and which one is lower and in terms of scalability and you can have several to 1000 levels for stack the bar chart attributes and so that means you can have up to maybe 10 or maybe slightly more than 10 different segments in each bar and beyond that it will be difficult to tell and the bars and even for this you can see it's quite difficult to show to see here already and this is the bar and which looks like almost like only two parts but really it is the same as all these other bars it should have five segments is just for these one here the red is dominant is very large values and the all the four other four x segment is very small and become difficult to see and it's similarly if you have too many segments and each segment becomes small and it will become difficult to see okay and here is some other variations and um, of and bar chart and you can potentially have and uh, this is called a range bar chart and so first and this is like the bar now the categorical key is now on the y-axis that's completely and um, possible and there's nothing special about it and, and then most commonly it would have this uh, here and now the x-axis is value it shows a salary range so now it's not showing a bar starting from zero always and it shows a range that's a ranged bar chart so in this case we can say oh, we still has one quantitative key which is shown on the y-axis sorry one qual a qualitative key or categorical key and then for each bar it's actually showing two values one is a start point the other one is the end point so use two quantitative attributes or the values for each items. Okay, uh, yeah, and this is again another different variations of the bar chart and it's called the waterfall chart. And in this particular example, it's showing the blue part is the amount of the income and the, the other part, the red one, is the amount of the expenses of a company. And so you have this much income from sales, this much from the service, which give you this much in total. And then for this much total, you have this much research expense, this much is for marketing, and this much is for salary. So the red one, so it always changes, but again, the bars are no longer aligned in the sense they don't always start from here zero. Instead, it always starts from where the previous one ends in this case, and uh, also depends on the semantics of what bar represents. For example, this bar starts from here because we want to see the overall values. And when we actually show the overall values, it doesn't really start from where the previous one ends. And this is where it breaks down. Uh, so we have this, 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 and this is called operating income. So that basically means the total revenue taken out all these three. Let's give you this value. And then you take out the actual tax that becomes the next net income. So here is you still have the alignment, but the alignment between the bars changes in the low, no longer always at the bottom. Otherwise, it's still the same as a bar chart. Okay, and uh, finally, we're going to look at the another very common ones, which is the line chart. Okay, and it still shows an one key and uh, one value. So the key is usually depends on which dimension, but in this case, and um, it's a year. The key itself, in this case, is different in the sense itself is no longer a categorical value. And in many of the 
bar chart example, the key itself is categorical, so it doesn't have order, but or can't do it, not even. But here it's usually at least ordered, which means it has a natural order, or in this case it's quantitative because you can actually say take 2006 and minus 2004 to some computation. And in terms of value, again, could be any values, could be profit, could be sales, which has a different values for each of the key. Okay. And then in terms of data, we had actually two quantitative attributes. One is the key, the other one is the value you want to show. And the marker is points, and then the line connecting the points. So that's a little bit weird. It's like you have both line and point. Sorry, both point and the line. And But here, uh, the point is the main thing. The line itself does not represent any particular attribute. The line is just there to strengthen the trend. That's all it is. It does not represent any particular value. Okay. And uh, in terms of channels, we'll be familiar by now. And we use both the X and Y channel to represent the key and the one attribute. Okay. And so it's good at finding trend, right? So as we already mentioned, we use the line here. It doesn't actually represent any value. It just, and to emphasize or visually emphasize the trend. So you could potentially just take out the line, then you have the dots, which essentially is just a scatter plot. And this is just with addition of the line to show that the trend. Okay. And, uh, In a sense, and the bar chart is quite similar to a line chart, we can easily imagine. So something you can represent as a line chart can be easily represented the bar chart as well. So here, instead of showing line and connect, uh, so easily, instead of showing dots and connecting them, you can just have a bar for each year. So you can see 2004, what is the bar? Put, put a bar there. And then for 2005, you have another bar where the height represents the average weight. Okay, and so when to use a bar chart and when to use a line chart. And one thing is depends on the type of key attribute, which is a type of the... So bar chart is good for if the key is categorical. In this case, it shows female and male, whereas line chart is good for ordered or counted or ordered and attributes, including quantitative. And so for example, and the year of the and population or average year, sort of average age, or in the previous examples, which is the year, and these are all ordered. In these case, line chart are better. Okay, and then also the subtle difference. So the line chart, sorry, the bar chart encourage and comparison, and so this one, it makes as it really just to. It's good at showing the difference between, say, the average height between the female and male, and to show the comparison, whereas the line chart is showing to encourage the trend. So you can kind of say, and if you use a line chart, and this would show the average height is increasing when it's, the age is increased from 10 to 12 years old. Okay. And you can potentially do exactly the same thing, but use a bar chart. So you have 10 years old and 12 years old. And again, if we use a bar chart, it's now encouraging comparison. You can say, then the message you want to show will be slightly different, it says, and the average height of 12 years old is maybe say 10 centimeters compared higher than the average height of 10 years old. Okay, so exact the same data, the message is slightly different. So this saying the height is increasing as you're getting older, and this one saying the average difference between the two age groups is this much. Yeah. 
Okay, so this is possible in terms of you can use bar chart when the categorical value, sorry, when the key is ordered, but the, this combination where the key is categorical, you cannot really using line chart because, for example, um, this one, we are showing where the key is categorical, but we're showing connecting that using a line chart. It doesn't really make any sense. And you can't really say that's any particular trend. Say, you can't say you change from female to male, then your height would increase. That doesn't really make any sense. Okay, so this last one should not be used for the cat. If the key is categorical, and you should always just using bar chart if you want to show one value. And if the key is ordered, and you have the option to use a bar chart or a line chart, and then then depends on what you want to say. If you want to do a comparison, you should use bar chart, and if you want to show the trend, you should be using line chart. And the finally, and if the key is categorical, you should avoid using line chart because it doesn't really make sense. Okay, and finally, going to show you and some of the a few examples of variations or common variations of line chart. Okay, um, so this is called line chart with an axis breaks, and so. If you see carefully, you probably would think, ah, oh, this is probably just a normal uh, line chart. But what you're seeing here is the scale here, you have 600, 800, 1000. You would expect this one to be 1200, but instead it's actually 1800. There's a much bigger jumper here. The reason this might happen is sometimes you might run out of space, you just need some space. And you try to use this kind of scale, but in general, that's not a very good way to do because, and then the people have to manually adjust to try to when they try to estimate the difference. And for example, and the difference between those two visually might be similar to say the difference between these two, at least not that much, but the actual value is much higher because there's a distance here represents much more than the same distance here. That makes the, say, the estimation or comparison more difficult. And sometimes this can be misleading. And then sometimes people use this deliberately to show, to either highlight or hide the difference. For example, in this case, people might want to hide the difference of this part is actually much higher. Now it looks almost, there's not that much change here. Okay, and this is um, quite common as well. You can have multiple line charts. And then the, the things you need to be careful here is, and you might have to use different um, axes for each line chart. And that part can be a bit confusing. So in this case, we have three line charts, but say for the blue one, and the scale is from zero actually to 100K or 100,000. And for the red one, which is the lowest one, and its scale is from zero to 50K. So it's only half the value of the blue one. And finally, we have this purple one. It's from zero to 60K. Again, it's a different one. Okay. So even though we can see, uh, let's say, uh, blue and red, say this blue and this red, and uh, the value are not that different, but actually, and this blue in term value wise is maybe twice the value of this red because the scale wise, uh, the blue one is about twice, is exactly twice the scale. The height on the, the same height in the, for the blue is represent twice the value as the height in the red. So the reason to do this is if you want to see the relative change or the trend between the different values. So in this case, you can easily see, or one can argue, say, the overall trend is similar between these three values, even, they, even though they are not exactly the same. And you can imagine if I plot 
all three on exactly the same scale, then say the red one will be much lower down here and its change will be much less visible, right? basically twice, reduce it to twice of 100K. And it will be harder to compare whether the up and down is similar. And here you kind of sacrificing in terms of actual compelling the absolute values to make it easier to see the similarity between the trends. Okay, and this is another common example and nothing too difficult. It's just how do you connect these lines? And you can just use straight lines to connect these points. And in this case, is use something called a spine line, essentially to make a curve the connection between these points. And sometimes, and people prefer this, but usually in terms of validation, not that much difference. And I guess the only difference is, for example, when you look at this part over here, and it might make people think it's actually bent, but in reality is we don't really have any data in between these one, and just we just don't know what the actual value is. And this way, it might give people the impression, say, that somehow the value goes down in between these two points. Okay, and you can also have this one, it's called a step line chart. It's another variation of how do you connect between the points. And instead of a straight line or curve, here it's used this kind of uh, poly line or made up line segment, but only horizontal or vertical line segment. So when the value is the same, you only go to the right. But when the value is different, you go to the right, and then you either go up or go down. And so this might be useful, and especially when the values is usually, um, how do I say, has a fixed steps. So in this case, it's always changed by 0.1%. So it's from 4.8 to 5, and then to 4.7, and back to 4.9. It's always changed by steps, maximum 0.1 step. So it can be useful. And you can color the area below the line to see. And to make it easier to see, again, there's no clear indication, say, whether you color or not, and make it easier to see the trend or not, or compare the value. But, and that's quite common, and people use that a lot, and that's called area chart. Okay. And then there is a potential you need to be aware. There's two variations. So for example, sometimes in this case, and both lines, the red and blue line, they all start from zero. So there's a little bit overlap between the blue and the, the green. So this part basically overlaps. And you can also have a stack the area chart. And in this case, and the red one, is stacked on top of the blue one. So almost like the stacked bar chart we had before. Then say the value for the blue here is not 160K, but only just between 100K here and here. So it's maybe over the 50K. So, and you have to, there's no way you can tell whether it's a normal area chart or a stacked area chart you have to really read the text to understand exactly how that is meant to be. Okay, and finally, we're gonna introduce um, one called, oh, not how, finally, but the second last example, and it's called a horizontal chart. And so this is like a one come out of the research recently, allows you to represent the same information, but using much less space and almost as effective with some initial training. So let's say this is the line chart we want to show. And what you can do initially, and you can break that into different segments, for everything above, say the baseline or average will be orange and below will be blue, and depends on how much higher above the average, you have different shade of orange, yeah? So then you can cut this into different segments and then flip this one over. So this becomes 
the same representation, same show, same information of this, but using much less space. So this one, which is below, is now flipped up. But because of the color, you, that you know it's actually below. That means something below average. And the rest, you can see how much higher it is above average it depends on the color. So actually, you know here, it actually has the highest values because it has the darkest orange. Yeah. And if you compare this one to this one, it's only used a third, sorry, a, a quarter of the space. Basically, you cut the, in, the height into four parts, and you only need to use one part out of the four to display. But you have to mentally um, to think, OK, this is actually not a high value. This is a low value. And the higher the here, the lower the value, for example. But actually, people have done some experiments after some training, and people, the performance using this kind of chart and is almost as good as this chart. And so this works particularly well when you need to show a multiple time series. So in this case, and the vertical space becomes very important using this kind of horizontal chart. And you can see you can fit in many more, in this case, four times more and time series compared to using this type of presentation. And you can relatively see, OK, and which one is doing well and where the highest and lowest points are in the time series. You can still do that quite easily once you get used to it. OK, and this is another chart. So it's called the stream graph. And it's a variation of the stack the bar chart and in the sense. And it's no longer aligned. So the start point is not always, not always at the bottom. And also, there's no obvious bars, but it's just look at each particularly um, X position. You can have many things stacked one on top of another. Let me see if I get, get the actual. Oh, no, I don't have a screen here. And so it's try to show the horizontal continuity. And it show, usually it's good at showing things change over time. And you have one categorical attributes, and which is which kind of stream you have or which color band you have among the variations. That's categorical. And then another key is this X position. So that's the same as a, if you remember the stack bar chart, and you have two keys. One is X position. The other one is which part of this bar or which stack out of the bar you're representing. So it's the same here. I just represent it visually. And then you have the one quantitative value, which is shown by the height of that part of the stack or part of the, yeah. OK, and in this particular example, it shows the popularity of different bands over time. So x axis is the time. And the height of the color band shows, so the different color means different band, maybe represents the type of music as well. But say for the height of the particular band shows how popular that is. So that means this band is quite popular by that time, but then that popularity reduces. This is kind of the most popular band at that time. And finally, this is the most popular one recently. OK. Uh, I'm going to just, because we're running out of time, I'm going to skip through these now. And finally, I just want to show you a quick um, animation. So we, for these uh, the different type of data, we, for the table data, basically, we present it in many different ways. and. In theory, you can always use all these different visual, visual representations, and they, but not the only difference is depends on the type of the attributes and the message you want to represent. And sometimes, and some of these representations will work better than the others. So I'm going to just show you a simple animation, which tells you how the works. Uh, Okay, 
So you have the line chart and use this is a horizontal graph we've seen before. This is just a normal graph. This is stack the bar chart, stream graph. This is overlapping the area chart. And this is a different one to show area chart, which may be a different way to show the stacked one. You can use bar chart or pie chart if you didn't cover. And yeah, so this is how you can represent almost exactly the same data using different chart types we covered today. Professor, can we make these in Tableau? And not all of them. For example, I don't think Tableau makes uh, the stream graph or the horizontal graph. The basic ones, the, the bar chart and the line chart definitely does. Okay. Yeah. Professor, can we do uh, the animations? Uh, yes, and you can do animations, but not in the sense you can change between different chart types. For example, you can and show how the values and change over time. They so start from here, and over the time, the values goes higher and higher. That's possible. Um, but it's, you can't say change from line chart to bar chart and then to some other chart types. Use animation. But you could do is you have to manually create okay. these charts and made it into a story. Okay, and Would that's you want all. to suggest us any software that will help us do that, Professor? Oh, like uh, the first one you, yeah. saw, you should write the gap, gap minder, something like that. Yes, so the gap minder itself is software that you can use. Okay, so by the way, all these things I mentioned, mm -hmm. you have the link in the slides, and if you click the link, it should go to you to the, show you the go to the page where that is. And this one particularly will tell you it's using D3 to create this. And so usually to create any of these animations, you really have to write some code. And there's very few tools which allow you to do this kind of thing without writing code. And uh, the first examples we showed, uh, which is the, let me find the first example. Well, which, uh, uh, which is the oh, maybe still on the in the browser, yeah. Uh, this guide mind itself, and it's something you don't have to uh, write code. And but the downside is, for this tools, you can only use this type of validation. You can't really change yes. the validation. You can change what value map to the x, y, or color or the size, but that's the only thing you can change. And there's nothing else you can change. There's certain limitations. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Oh. Uh, okay. I'll stop there now.